Hi guys, so this is just a short slideshow about Canada and its contribution to World War One. So this is really just kind of an overview of what Canada was doing in the war. So we'll look at their involvement on the European front. We'll look at the Canadian contribution to, to winning the war, some famous Canadian war heroes, and a very quick look at some of what was going on in Canada itself during the war. At the beginning of the war, it uh, was actually not really down to Canada whether they were entering this war or not. As a British Dominion, they were entered automatically uh, to fight for Britain. Not that that really made much of a difference anyhow in the beginning. Lots and lots of Canadians were eager to volunteer. Uh, many were British people who had recently emigrated to Canada anyway. Um, and generally, apart from in Quebec, perhaps, there was a great deal of support for Great Britain and its role in this uh, European war. Canadians uh, had their first major action at the Battle of Kitchener's Wood, and this was essentially a large German attack that forced uh, segments of the British and the French line to withdraw, leaving the Canadians flanked. And some way or another, they were able to maintain that line, maintain their position, and the Canadian commander, Arthur Curry, who we'll see later, was able to bring up British reinforcements, convince them to support him again. Um, the Canadians were chlorine gassed, and this was uh, one of the first instances, if not the first, where chlorine gas was used as a new weapon. And they suffered pretty terrible casualties as a result of this, but they did show that they were able to hold a position and operate like a professional army. So at this point, they're still under British command. Um, but it's one of those instances that will lead to an increasing respect for Canadian arms. Another notable engagement is the Battle of Bowman Hamill, and this is part of the Battle of the Somme, one of the most infamous engagements in, in this war for its casualty rates. And uh, Newfoundland Labrador Regiment was still pretty small at this point, but you can see here during that engagement only 68 of uh, 800 men surviving that were uh, attacking. and even by World War I standards, that is a pretty terrible casualty rate. It must be a rather strange day every year in the Finland Labrador on July the 1st because it is Canada Day, so all of Canada is usually celebrating the birth of the nation, or, or at least they're celebrating the anniversary of Confederation since 1867. Um, but this is also the anniversary of this day when this Newfoundland Labrador regiment was almost wiped out completely. And you can see here uh, the commemoration of this uh, during or just after the war, quite fittingly with a statue of a moose. The Battle of Vimy Ridge is incredibly important in Canadian history. And there's a few reasons for this. Uh, I'd say probably the, f the main two main reasons are the fact that this was a victory that was the result of really just Canadians operating on their own. They had been given license to plan and execute this attack uh, under their own Canadian commanders, whereas previously they had been uh, embedded in British divisions and under British command. Um, but this time, the um, Canadian commander, Arthur Curry is given responsibility for this objective. This is a ridge that the British and the French have failed to take for three years. And the Canadians, they prepare very, very well for this. Uh, Curry was a bit of a different commander, really. He is a bit of an outsider, maybe. He's a failed insurance salesman, uh, an ex-school teacher. He's a, he's a militia commander who has risen through the ranks of the militia in BC. And so he's got a bit of a different way, perhaps, of looking at things. And he's very cautious about uh, using his men. He does not use his men um, as cannon fodder, as it, as it appears that some of the British and the French commanders do. Um, Curry is much more innovative. So the preparation involves a large scale model, which the troops practice on. Uh, Curry is also very keen on even the privates and the corporals and those low ranking soldiers uh, knowing the plan, at least for their sector, and knowing what to do if their commanding officer was killed. Uh, so this was a very coordinated, well-planned out attack. You may have heard of the creeping barrage before. 
and that was the technique of using an artillery barrage that would uh, move forward as your men advanced and be essentially a kind of wall of shielding fire that was destroying the enemy or at least keeping their heads down um, that you could advance right behind. It's a pretty risky tactic, of course. If you get it wrong, it can be pretty disastrous for your own men. Um, but it worked. It works well at Vimy Ridge, and it actually becomes adopted by British and French commanders uh, in many instances thereafter. Um, probably the most important reason, or at least what Canadian historians say is the most important reason um, for remembering Vimy Ridge, is not just the sacrifice of these men, but the fact that all Canadians fought together. This was a Canadian army uh, with all the regiments from all the different parts of Canada fighting under Curry's command. And there was a sense afterwards that a nation had been created in a way. You know, a lot of countries have this kind of idea that um, the nation is born in a battle or a war um, when all people from different parts of the country fight together. And that's certainly like a big part of mythology in Canadian nationalism. Uh, Passchendaele. Um, the Canadians were by now establishing a reputation for themselves as pretty effective shock troops. Uh, Vimy Ridge had been taken in just three days, which by World War One standards was lightning quick. Um, the Battle of Passchendaele, you might know, is famous for the mud and for a lot of soldiers actually just drowning in that mud even before they could get into action. Um, this is important in the Canadian history of the war in a tragic way in the sense that uh, Curry was was ordered by British commanders to attack and take a ridge and did protest and say that well he could do it but he thought he may lose about 16,000 men uh, if he was ordered to do this. Uh, unfortunately he didn't have a choice in this case and they went ahead with the attack and I think actually the Canadians lost like 15,664 men or something like that. So uh, Curry's pr prediction was eerily accurate and is maybe a reflection of the kind of grasp of planning and detail and logistics that this man had. 1917 was a great year and a terrible year for Canada. Uh, a great year in that uh, Vimy Ridge was an amazing victory for the Canadians. That was a great help to the Allies' war, war effort. Um, but unfortunately also later on in the year, there was a disastrous accident uh, just outside of Halifax Harbor. Um, a ship carrying ammo, uh, the Mont Blanc, unfortunately collided with a Norwegian ship, the Emo. And this wouldn't normally be such a terrible disaster in of itself, but unfortunately, the Mont Blanc uh, caught fire. There was uh, benzo oil, I think, on, on the deck there. And this fire spread to the ammo store they had. Now, the explosion that resulted from this is absolutely legendary. It was immense and it flattened a large area. So an 800 meter radius was completely flattened. Um, the main forward gun on the Mont Blanc was thrown and landed two miles away. Uh, 2,000 people were killed, 9,000 injured. There was even a tsunami caused by the explosion uh, and a local community of Mi'kmaq uh, indigenous people were almost wiped out in the Tufts Cove area. Uh, there was some heroism too that is notable, like the, the fire crew that tragically rushed onto the deck of the Mont Blanc to try and put the fire out and were unable to do so unfortunately in time. Uh, the telegraphist who stayed at his post uh, to warn surrounding towns of what was about to happen when they realized the explosives were going to go up. Some famous Canadian war heroes. Uh, this is uh, Francis Pegamagabo, and he's an indigenous or Aboriginal sniper who actually becomes the greatest sniper of the war. He holds the record for World War One with 378 kills and, and 300 captures. A truly remarkable career. Um, later on, goes on to become a chief for his nation back home after the war. Uh, World War One was also notable for seeing the start of aerial warfare. And uh, the Canadians had a very famous fighter race in Billy Bishop. Uh, 
credited with 72 kills, third ranking ace of the war. He is also thought to have fought the Red Baron to a standstill. And actually it's a Canadian, another Canadian, Roy Brown, this guy on the far right here, who is actually credited with killing the Red Baron. Uh, now there's some disagreement there, like there were some Australian troops on the ground in the area at the time that were also firing at the Red Baron who claim credit, so it's not entirely clear-cut, but uh, I think the general consensus is that Roy Brown um, did play the pivotal role in bringing the Red Baron down. Canadians are also notable uh, at the end of the war for leading a breakthrough during those last hundred days. It was, it was Canadian forces, again, under the command of Arthur Curry that led the Canadian attack through the Hindenburg Line. So the war ends, and it's quite interesting here that Canada actually insists on signing the Treaty of Versailles independently of the British. And this has been, this does not come out of the blue. Uh, the British had given dominions autonomy within the Commonwealth in 1917. And Robert Borden, the Canadian Prime Minister, uh, had been slightly resistant to British command during the war, uh, during some of the worst battles in which Canadians suffered higher casualties. Canadian politicians had said, uh, we're not entirely happy about being under British command if it's gonna involve these kind of massacres. Um, and in fact, uh, after one battle, the Canadian prime minister actually warned the British and said, I'm not gonna keep supplying you with men and volunteers. Uh, if this is the way you're going to conduct this war. Anyway, all that aside, relations with Britain remain pretty good overall, but it is notable that Canada is pulling away from them, from the United Kingdom, um, and they do sign this important treaty on their own. So a little bit about the domestic front during the war, what was actually happening back home in Canada. One of the biggest controversies was the conscription crisis. And this was essentially when the Canadian government realized that they were gonna start running out of volunteers for the war and they were gonna to have to bring in some sort of compulsory draft and force Canadian men to go and fight in Europe. So a bill was eventually passed that instituted this, but not without a lot of resistance, especially from Quebec. Uh, there was actually riots in Quebec and Montreal uh, even people killed in those riots. So the resistance was pretty fierce and a lot of Quebec separatism apparently can be traced back to, modern Quebec separatism anyway, can be traced back to this time. Uh, this conscription crisis was to repeat itself in World War II as well, when most of Canada again was supportive of the British war effort and most of Quebec was not. Uh, leading this resistance at the time was Henri Bourassa, you can see here, and he was to become one of the father figures of Quebec separatism. Uh, now in the end, as I said, conscription was introduced, but it was so late that it didn't really have any practical effect. By the time the troops that were conscripted had arrived in Europe, the war was practically over anyhow. Uh, but again, long-standing kind of effects from this, you can trace a lot of Quebec separatism to this particular crisis. Also, and again, very similar to what happened in World War II, the government passed some pretty strong legislation that enabled them to uh, enforce certain powers, such as, unfortunately, uh, interning people that they saw as potentially disloyal. So uh, Canadian Germans, Canadian Austrians, Canadian Hungarians, and Canadian Turks, you can see here, uh, ordered to report to the office of the registrar uh, for alien enemies, pretty awful way for Canadians to be treated. Um, and we see this again in World War II with Japanese Canadians after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Um, and again, some of these people interned in prison camps, much like in World War II when Japanese Canadians were taken away and uh, put in a sort of prison camp in the Okanagan Valley, for instance, those uh, Japanese Canadians living in BC. Uh, and the emergency powers that they passed, yes, um, did give the government extraordinary power. And we, we see this again in World War II, uh, when the government gives itself the power to confiscate whatever it needs to prosecute the war effort. Uh, 
Also domestically, very important time for women's rights. Uh, the famous five, Ellie McClung, Agnes MacPhail and so on, have been fighting for a while and will continue to do so for the right to vote. Uh, and there is great progress made during the war. So the Prairie Provinces, uh, Manitoba, Alberta, Saskatchewan, they give the vote to women in 1916, at least in those provinces. And soldiers' wives get the right to vote in 1917. Uh, and then eventually we have the federal right to vote for women in 1918. And m much like uh, other Western democracies, a lot of the impetus for this right to vote comes not just from the women's suffrage movement, which has been active now for decades, but also the fact that Canadian women had stepped up and were working in those factories and those jobs that men had been doing as the men had gone off to fight and women had demonstrated beyond a reasonable doubt that they were just as capable as men of doing these kind of technical and manual jobs. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, I would reiterate that the war was important to Canada because Canada made a very significant contribution to World War One. They definitely established a reputation for military competence. Uh, you even had German commanders talking about being afraid when they knew that they had to face the Canadians in battle. Uh, Canadian also, Canada had become more assertive of its own rights and identities. And you see that with Borden pushing back against British command and insisting on siding the Treaty of Versailles separately. And subsequently to this, then in the interwar years, you do see Canada uh, asserting itself more independently of Britain. And we also have those important domestic changes again. We, we have some positive things like uh, women's suffrage, women getting the vote as a result, largely you could say of proving themselves during the war. Uh, but unfortunately you also have that tension with Quebec, uh, which you can really trace uh, over many, many decades and you could say culminated perhaps in those 1980, 1995 referendums. Uh, I will leave you here with a poem by John McRae. He was a Canadian soldier and surgeon, uh, unfortunately killed not long after writing this poem. And this poem has become in Canada, the kind of go-to poem on Remembrance Day, when we remember uh, the end of the war.